quick bio on me. I'm 56 years old. I was born and raised in New Jersey. I guess you can talk by the you can hear by the way I speak. I'm not from around here. Um, I have a bachelor's in English. I served as a Marine Corps officer for five years. I was never shot at. Uh, I started law school in 1988 and loading trucks for UPS the same day. We all did. That's that's how we were brought up in, uh, in our uh, business environment. I've been married 32 years to my lovely wife, who's sitting next to Claudine. Um, and we have four adult children right now. And our eldest son happens to be, uh, to my great shame, he joined the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't understand that. So he's an F-18 pilot. And he doesn't get that from me. I won't get up on a ladder. He gets that from his mother. Uh, the book that I wrote, uh, The March of the 18th, was inspired by Bruce Catton's iconic work and Pulitzer Prize winning work of 60 years ago, A Stillness at Appomattox. Now he devotes only three pages three pages in this work of his, which really is, is the book to read for narrative nonfiction uh, on the Civil War. Uh, he only goes three pages to the Invalid Corps, or which became the Veterans Reserve Corps. Uh, three pages only. I took those three pages, tracked the movements of the actual 18th from its inception in Washington, D.C., moving by boat down the Potomac, and culminating in a two-day, 25-mile force march where they averaged one mile an hour. These are people with amputations and other debilitating injuries where they otherwise could not serve in a frontline capacity. So Catton's work inspired the book. The wrong button, yes, okay. The right button. It started as the invalid corps. This is the history piece. And history is about facts and stats. So I'm going to give it to you kind of rapidly. The invalid corps started in administrative half steps. They had invalids, people with debilitating injuries that still wanted to serve. Now remember, the, uh, the soldier of the era during the Civil War had really two reasons to serve, continue to serve even after having a, a horrific injury. Uh, they needed to eat. The soldier of the time was a laborer. They were, they were hands on. But they also had altruistic reasons. They wanted to continue service because they felt that their sacrifice should be also, even though now their lives would change forever, it had to be for a greater reason. In April of 1862, the original hope of a short 90-day war ended at Bull Run, otherwise known as Manassas. The Shiloh casualties, which were horrific and in the 20 to 30,000 range, also confirmed the duration of the war. It was not going to be a simple show. It was going to be a pitched battle to the end, and there was only going to be one victory and one outcome. Conscription followed, especially for the Northern Army, as manpower uh, diminished. Uh, by 1863-64, most of the Army of the North uh, was uh, either conscripts or draftees. By April of 62, there were enough veterans that had problems with continuing to serve with all kinds of injuries. So they kept them as nurses, cooks, and hospital attendants. Within the next year, it expanded to guard and non-combat duty, which is very significant, which tells you the drain it was on the forces of the North. By April 28th of 1863, a general order came out that there would be an organized invalid corps. And you can imagine the words invalid corps, what that would be, that would be a, kind of a negative connotation that the soldiers themselves saw them as soldiers and not as invalids. They initially started in rear guard duties around Washington, D.C., and I'm going to give you some examples of that in a second. The first uniform itself was a robin's egg blue, and the, the Army of the North were blue coats, right, dark navy blue coats. A robin's egg blue, uh, what, in essence what it did, uh, and think of what the military uniform does, it identifies the person first tells you what you've done, where you've been, where you're qualified, what your rank is, how long you've been in the service. That's what the military uniform does. It also dignifies the soldier to a great degree. A robin's egg blue uniform takes them out of the normal scope of what a soldier is and gives them a, a special status they did not want. So the robin's egg blue uniform was not considered favorably by the uh, soldiers of the Veterans Reserve Corps. By October of 63, there were 16 regiments with almost 500 officers and 18,000 enlisted, forming 200 companies. The soldiers, soldiers excuse me, who were meritorious and deserving were allowed. Almost no injuries were disallowed. And then the initial uh, 
three battalion structure went like this. The first battalion of any regiment that was formed, the first battalion were soldiers that had injuries that precluded them from fighting on the front line, but did not preclude them from carrying a weapon, carrying a pack, and the like. For instance, they did not have amputations, but they might have had a wrenched back, a wrenched neck, something along those lines. Uh, common knee injuries that half the people in the room have right now would prevent them from serving in the military, but those people were basically the first battalion. The second battalion had more serious injuries, uh, partial blindness, partial deafness, or full deafness, um, am including amputations of at least one limb. The prime and the third battalion were people that were still trying to be mustered out. Some people still with grievous injuries that prevented the mobility still wanted to serve. The Army wanted to accommodate, but they can only accommodate so much. All of them were volunteers, and this is very significant. By 63-64, remember, the Northern Army is almost primarily conscripts and draftees. So if all are volunteers, that says something more about the spirit of the people that wanted to serve in the Veterans Corps. <coughs> By 1864, it changed its names to the Veterans Reserve Corps. They didn't want to be called invalids. They also ditched that Robin's Egg blue uniform and they went back to the blue coats, just like everyone else. The most distinguished day, and this is an outline of a story, but Jubal Early, the Southern uh, General, attacked Washington, D.C. on this day. That's something that is not widely known. Uh, they were within four miles of the White House at the time. It absolutely would have turned the war. The city was defended then by clerks and the Veterans Reserve Corps. Grant had reinforced the city late in the afternoon. He mistakenly had sent, because he didn't think Washington was going to uh, be attacked by early, had mi mistakenly had sent most of the forces were en route at, the point, at that point to Virginia. So clerks and veterans of the Reserve Corps, many battalions of them, by the way, over 10,000, were there in Washington, D.C. They defended D.C. from Jubal Early's attack. The VRC lost five killed and then seven more severely wounded, which I don't know how much more wounded you can get if you already have a debilitating injury or an amputation. Um, the provost marshal at the time said the Corps' career has been one of usefulness and honor. Now, by May of 1865, the war is effectively over. The VRC at that point in time had 762 officers, almost 30,000 enlisted men. This is twice as large as the pre-war standing army for the entire United States of America. The pre-war army was only 15,000 strong. Compare this, uh, the Veterans Reserve Corps to this. I, uh, look, I'm a junkie for statistics. I can't help it, I like it, I enjoy them, and I think they're very telling, especially in a historical framework. 75% of this, uh, they had a 75% survival rate for all the amputees that were in the Northern Army. That's very significant. You compare that to the same era type of uh, war, the Franco-Prussian War, within the same generation in Europe, where it had only a 30% survival rate. That goes to the medical care that was being taken for the, uh, um, really, for both sides. And uh, it, it, it speaks largely to the knowledge on how to do post-care. And a lot of post-care is finding effective use and effective employment, if you will, for those who already have these injuries. The 2nd Battalion units, as an example, and remember these are the ones that have amputations, have some mobility problems, cannot carry a full pack, uh, some of them can't even uh, shoot a weapon effectively, but they can load a weapon, um, were part of police activity during the New York City anti-draft riots. Here's a quick rundown of some of the other unit services. The third, which suppressed rioting, a rioting volunteer brigade in Ver, uh, Burlington, Vermont. The sixth, from 63 to 65, formed with over 10 different units from three different states. A quick aside, if you recall from our lessons on the, on the Civil War, most of them were uh, community-based. This is the 14th Pennsylvania. They all came from the same town. They all had the, the, the mayor was there, right down to the person that collected uh, garbage. They were all part of the unit. I chose the 18th not only because Bruce Catton, if he thought it was good enough, well, it was good enough for me to expand on, um, but the 18th was the only one from my research that was actually mobile, moving from D.C. down to Belle Plaine by boat and the two-day force march. As an aside, this is, I'm taking this as an excerpt from Bruce Catton's work. On the 20th of June, 1864, the 2nd Battalion, remember this is very debilitating injuries, so the 18th Regiment was engaged in a skirmish with Confederate Raiders. 
a Union courier galloped, galloped up to the officer in charge of the 18th. Will your invalid stand, asked the courier. The colonel replied, well, tell a general that my men are crippled so they can't run. Right? This is the sum total of what was mentioned in Catton's work, aside from its movement, and nothing else. I thought this was a story that should be told. And in order to flesh it out, I created some characters and a plot line, and that's the book that I have here today. Now, just to give you a little bit of flavor of it, this is Company I of the 9th Veterans Reserve Corps. This is the band, one of the two bands in Washington, D.C. at the time. If you look in the middle of the center of the photo, you see a statue. That's George Washington. This is Washington Circle in D.C. Uh, that statue at that point is only two years old. All right, so if you've ever been to, you've been to D.C., love D.C. If you've been there, you can see that statue there, and you understand that this photograph is taken when that's only two years old. And that's uh, VRC, uh, the ninth. This is just a picture I collected of an average uh, Veterans Reserve Corps, Reserve Corps soldier uh, who joined it in 64. He actually deserted in 65. Uh, picture below, and I want to give this just as a contrast. So you can note the youth of some of the, of the two people here. The one standing is in the powder blue uniform. This is a picture of a couple of reenactors. They're wearing a powder blue uniform. You can see the distinction with it. Uh, one of the ironic things about the, uh, the button movement, and I read this online, you can look up anything online, is uh, why would they give so many buttons to people that might be missing hands? <laughs> All right, now, I'm gonna segue now from the history of it to something I learned. One of the gentlemen who read the book was actually one of, uh, a medical doctor, a psychotherapist with the United States Air Force, Gerald Tuttle. Uh, he's retired now, he's about 73 years young. Uh, he read the book, and he was one of the original uh, diagnosticians, if I got that word, for PTSD. And he diagnosed it in the 1970s as being a debilitating illness, not something that was uh, um, uh, shell shock or cowardice or any of those other things. And that PTSD applies, it's not just a military thing, it's not a violent thing. It's a mental condition that needs work, it needs help, it needs therapy. So I've spent many hours with Dr. Tully. He's a wonderful man. He loved my book, by the way, if I can use that as a left-handed uh, self-serving comment. Um, and, and he's a wonderful guy. Now he talks, and, uh, and uh, in his discussions, because he's had separate discussions, we've married some of our presentation. So I'm taking some of his now with his permission. You talk about crippling injuries and coping mechanisms. Now the crippling injuries are obvious with the Veterans Reserve Force. Um, there are, there are three different types of injuries that we could say are obvious for the sake of our discussion today. The first one is people that are born with an affliction. All right, they have an injury and they learn to cope with it. They have a family support mechanism. Uh, they learn to cope through uh, just the sheer wanting uh, gratitude of being alive, but they manage to cope. All right. Then you have the crippling wound from battle, uh, and both of these two clearly have different uh, diagnoses and therapy. What was fascinating about the research that I have on soldiers that are injured, their first thing is that they are grateful they're alive. That's number one. They always have some kind of uh, remorse for what if, but we all do. But the primary thing, they're alive, and that's what counts. All right? And then the last thing is the PTSD piece, which is really a, a, a medical condition. And it has to be, people understand it. That's not simply um, uh, mental. It is medical. Uh, and this can come from either experience or as a first responder. I want to do a quick sideways on, on the PTSD piece. Um, I wrote a book, and I do book signings at Barnes & Noble, and I talk to people all the time. I, uh, uh, on three different occasions, I've had people come up to me after it and start talking about their car accident 20 years ago, where they know something, you know, like, I'm suffering from it now, or I think I have PTSD from what happened to me in Vietnam. Those are just two of the, the examples. Um, all I tell them, and all I can tell them, is if you need help, you have to find a, uh, a, a way to get that help. I can help you find somebody, but I'm not, I can't help you with your problem. And I think what happens is a lot of people think that they can help with the problem, and they know nothing about it. And that's, that's a crucial piece. Um, and I'm not pretending I do. I'm not pretending I do. Uh, so other applications for Dr. Tubb. There are absolute distinctions between physical and mental injuries. Now, mental injuries, called PTSD, it's a medical condition. It's not limited to the military. It's anybody that's had a shocking uh, event in their life that they haven't been able to cope with, they haven't been able to compartmentalize. 
uh, normal reactions to overwhelming trauma, which is what that is, whether it's witnessed or experienced, and these uh, reactions are unpredictable and largely uncontrollable. The chief difference between people who develop PTSD and people who don't, either witnessed or experienced the exact same thing, is how they actually cope with the trauma itself. Now, and that coping mechanism can be exercised, that coping me mechanism can be challenged and uplifted and made correct, all right? Uh, they have to manage, master, and minimize the stress. That's up to the individual, and that's done through standard therapy procedures. I wrote up down a 12-sentence uh, outline for the story that I had in my head I, I, in a dream, and it took me about 13 months and I finished the book. Um, when I finished the book, I went to one of those uh, vanities publishing places called Zulon. It's the old, oldest Christian publisher in the world uh, for these type of things. And um, we put the book together. It's a beautiful cover. It's a 12-point font, so you don't need a telescope to read it. It's got the whole thing. It's great. Uh, I'm a little biased towards that, of course, as you can probably imagine. Um, the cool thing about the book was I liked it so much, and my wife liked it so much, she's my chief editor and critic. <laughs> um, and Maureen said to me, she goes, you know, Kevin, it's your book, but it's really their story. And she's right. And with that kind of clarity, I said, well, we're going to give half of it away. And that's what we've been doing. I'm very proud of the fact that since the beginning of this year, I've written checks for over $1,500 to five different agencies. I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of that. Now, why do I call them worthy charities? And this is my opinion. I'm not speaking for anybody but myself. More statistics. There are over 41,000, 41, that's 41 comma three zeros, veteran 501c3 charities in the United States today. How do you pick one? There's a huge percentage of them that are mismanaged, a huge percentage of them that want to do great things but are not doing client services with the vast amount of the money. I'm going to give you an example, and not to be disparaging, but it's, 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 it's public statistic. The Wounded Warrior Projects, we've seen a commercial on television, right? It's a good organization, they're trying to take care of people. Only 55% of those, that money goes to clients and client services. 45% of it goes to making those commercials, it goes to hiring professional people that know how to do those kind of things, that organize huge endowments. And their endowment is in the $25 million range. That's how much money they have to deal with, okay? So you need professionals that are compensated fairly to do that. Now, if they're all veterans, I'm all for it. I don't think they are. The agencies I list here are between, uh, one is at 90% and the others are 95 to 100%. I wanna just give you a quick rundown on these five that I found from my own research. The first one is Hope for the Warriors, 95% plus. Uh, they started in Virginia, they're also in uh, New York City, uh, and they run basically physical events for veterans, runs, swims, and the like. 95% of their money goes to charity. It's started by wives of the disabled veterans. The Phoenix Patriot Foundation, I'm in boots deep with these people. Jared Ogden, he's a uh, former U.S. Navy SEAL. He's uh, one of these television people that's the ultimate survivor of Alaska. They came in second place this last time. He's going to do a third season with them. Uh, he deals with double and triple amputees, mostly Marines, um, and uh, trying to give them physically challenging events to get them to give back to the community. Next is the Gary Sinise Foundation. Everybody knows the, uh, the award-winning actor. 100% of the money for the Gary Sinise Foundation goes to clients. He has four paid full-time staffers that works the foundation. He pays them out of pocket. All right, he's a tremendous guy. Okay guitar, tremendous, <laughs> tremendous person. <laughs> Tums to Towers was really a, a foundation that started with um, uh, a fireman that raced to the towers from his home in Staten Island on 9-11, and he was one of the firemen that lost his life, uh, Stephen Silla. Okay, and his brother Frank runs a foundation. Uh, another UPSer, another uh, uh, crazy person who works in Manhattan. Um, he is he is tied in. He and his wife are tied in with Tunnels to Towers. Ninety-five percent of their money goes, and they one of the projects that they do, and the reason why I mentioned it to you today is they 
build, improve, expand homes for wheelchair veterans. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing to do. It's a great thing to do. The American Legion's Operation Comfort Warriors, 100% of the monies for Operation Comfort Warriors goes to client to client services. I know the American Legion is a, is a national organization. Um, they do have a lot of money. Um, I asked them if I could use uh, their logo on my website, and they say, well, Kevin, if you can guarantee us $100,000 in revenue this year, absolutely put it on there. <laughs> well, I'm not going to use their logo. I, mean, I, I, I can't imagine why I wouldn't, but uh, they are wonderful people, uh, and they have given me a great deal of encouragement and help along the way. So with that, uh, just a reminder, half of the royalties that I uh, for the book itself, I give to charities for wounded vets, and these are the five charities I gave to since the beginning of this year. That's the website. I have I have books available. I have cards. I have uh, uh, bookmarks, and thank you very much. We do have some time left for questions. So, anyone here from? I know we have some folks from UPS, some folks who uh, <laughs> civil uh, civil war. Reenactors. So okay. All right. All right. From my reenacting friend. Anything? Did I deviate from the truth? Now you're 100 percent dead on. Okay, this is my favorite guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't <laughs> very good. <favorite. laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the first responders because it's it's the medics, the hospital corpsmen, the docs. Nobody talks about the PTSD that they experience dealing with the wounded. You know. It's significant. It is. It's absolutely significant. Um, any of us who have ever been in a car accident know that we have a problem with the car accident. We play that thing in our minds a thousand times. What if I had done something differently? And then the product of the accident, whether it's our own injury or someone else's injury, if I had done something else, or even if the other person had done something else, that first responder sees that every day, several times a day. And if they don't know how to compartmentalize that. They will not be able to finish out a career in that type of a job environment. It's very stressful, extremely stressful. Yes? I would just like to add a comment <clears throat> that um, I've dealt with a lot of people suffering from PTSD in terms of central night shelter. Um, uh, unfortunately, have had many deaths uh, end up in the streets. Um, because I think the stigma that is associated with PTSD, many vets either don't seek help or don't get the right help, and um, and it has become so debilitating yeah. that they end up in the streets. Right. So, and I and I think the VA is trying to address that, and and, and we actually. Central Night Shelter works with the VA. They're one of our referring agencies. Um, because I think Kevin and you would agree and anybody else who comes from a military background that for people to serve their country and then end up in the streets of the United States is unacceptable. So, um, it's it's more like criminal. I, I, I absolutely agree. It, it, I absolutely agree. If not for the generosity of your organizations, it, it, it would be a conflagration. I cannot tell you what it does to me to see someone in their uniform sleeping on the floor of our shelter. I mean, there's something wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think the VA is working hard to address right. these issues, so I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that, that people aren't aware of this, but I think that I think that there has been a culture where they, they were not aware of, of and, and just what you right. said sure. about, about staring, about, not, you know, it's not somebody who's like talking to nobody or, you know, that, that it's, there, there's such a range and a scope and it can be just as debilitating. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the so. fact that they can't cope with it, and remember there's two parts to it. Usually that person doesn't know what's happening to them. Exactly. They don't know why they, for want of a better expression, they don't know why they've zoned out, all right? But their other concern is, because they're perfectly lucid, is what does Pete think of me right now? Pete's looking at me. What does he think? 
And that's where things like paranoia and all those other things come in. That's why therapy is so crucial. To, to uh, my opinion, to address the, the homeless vet on the street. For every, my opinion is that for every one of those on the street, there's nine in homes that are being cared for by loved ones. Okay, and, 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 and that's the, that's, those are heroes to me. All right, because they, they, they've changed their lives to help somebody uh, that has something. Whether they're a veteran or not, they, they, people that have problems, it, it just happens that way. That's the way we should all be. Any of those charities that focus on um, uh, The other 40,995, I didn't mention, there's probably one out there. Uh, the ones that I chose, deliberately chosen because they're not um, employment oriented. Uh, not because that that's, that's a, a tricky thing to do. I'm on the board of the Community Assistance Center, another organization that Pete's a part of, spread too thin. But um, we, we spent an entire day yesterday, as a matter of fact, ironically, talking about employment for anyone that's looking for work. Um, the issues with employment are, uh, in my opinion, are much different than the issues of the disabled veteran that's looking to assimilate which is really the, the, the crux of what I'm trying to do here. It's, it's difficult for anybody to find a job. And, and I don't want to sound cold, but 90% of any employment is showing up. I, you, you just got to be at work. And if you got to be at work at, at 8, you have to be there at 8, not 8.15. I know it's, it's an oversimplification, but the biggest hurdle then becomes transportation. <laughs> you know, and of the other 10%, nine of it's attitude. I mean, it's, it's you know, you just, Come to your work with a happy heart, and everything will be fine. Um, it's we have a, we have an unemployment issue here in the United States. Uh, it is more challenging for someone with physical limitations to do physical work. So that person and the person, that, the, the people that I would counsel, because I, I mentor right now four different veterans that have gone from, and that none of them are injured in any capacity whatsoever, um, uh, that are going from the military into civilian life. These are per people perfectly capable that have a difficult time finding work. So if you have uh, uh, of a, of a limited amount of jobs, and you have someone, one of them's a lawyer, one has a college degree, two don't have college degrees, well, who are you going to pick for the particular work? Uh, you know, so the skill sets have to be improved. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and the president said, there are no shovel-ready jobs. It just doesn't work like that. There's, there's no turnkey to this. And a lot of it is, and I'm going to stop talking on this subject, but a lot of it is knowing people. It's networking. Yeah. All right, so if that person has niche skills, he's got to seek out people that know people with those kind of uh, requirements and needs. Yes, another Irish girl. From a historical perspective, how do, uh, and you might not know this, but how did the World War II veterans cope with their PSTP? that was undiagnosed, that was unrecognized. That was a whole lot of men who came back, yeah, and women. Who uh, who didn't volunteer. Right. I mean, that, that's a crucial piece. Remember, right. those who volunteer already have their own coping mechanism because they went in with some kind of expectation. Right. A direct answer to your question is I don't know. Okay. I think we look at uh, uh, we look at those. Uh, World War II right now, the average World War II soldier is, is 90. Okay, so in, per, in perspective, that's uh, you know, um, they're they're coping as coming on. I think, right? I, I also believe that um, we don't look at enough of the people that served as draftees in World War II that built the nation that we have today. Right? Um, there's a, only a very small percentage of people actually suffer from something. Okay, we need to find them help so they can develop their coping mechanisms. But if, when I think of World War II, the greatest generation, um, I think of the people not that are suffering or have suffered over the years. I think of the people that built our country into what it is today. And, and they, they, they changed the world. Yeah, so they, but they, they obviously the did experience the oh, horrors absolutely. before. Absolutely. So what was different about that generation? Oh, I don't know. In our generation. I don't, I, I, I don't I mean, know. I mean, it's an interesting through. question. It, it is. They, they were all uh, <clears throat> children of the Depression. Right. They knew what bad was. Uh, there was real evil in Europe and in the Far East during uh, those years. And then, so there was a real fight to destroy evil. And so yeah, I heard most of the studies said, too, that 
the United States as a whole was welcoming and warm and they were heroes. Where as the generations changed, you know, Vietnam was not wanted right. and people came back and, you know, were spit upon. Yeah. So the reaction and you see, you know, like Peter's looking at me, what is he thinking? Um, was completely different between World yes. War II and subsequent I, 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 that that's a valid distinction. I, I agree with that. Huge. I'm thinking yes. how Kevin got to know my therapist. But. Okay. <laughs> I was surprised that there was such a liberal of acceptance into the invalid core. Uh, how is how is that? Their, how are their injuries diagnosed to allow them to? Oh, because you said they were very. The very only requirement to be in the invalid core, which they abandoned that for veterans reserve corps. The only requirement was a willingness to serve. That was it, and of course they had to good conduct. They had to be deserving. But they basically didn't turn anyone away, anyone that wanted to serve, uh, and which I, I, I found fascinating. Um, they, were, they already had physical limitations, which is the number one reason why people can't join the military today, is because for some physical limitation. Uh, they already had that, but they were willing to serve. They, they sat guard duty, you know, for uh, veterans here. <laughs> All right, guard, do you ever sit during guard duty? No, I mean, that would be, you know, that's non-judicial punishment, lots of, lots of push-ups, you know, all kinds of things. But they were allowed to sit. Um, they paired them up. Those who with one arm was, was with somebody with somebody with two arms in order that they could work as a team to work a rifle. These people couldn't carry uh, more than five mini balls at a time. That was the, the basic round uh, that they used during the Civil War. Uh, remember, post-Civil War is when the machine gun came online. So this was still, a lot was still breech loaded, front barrel, muzzle loaded. They, they didn't really have more than one or two rounds that they could actually put in the weapon at a time. It was very physical work, very hard physical work. Yes. Oh, you want me to ask a question now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I had one earlier. No, in regards to, you made a comment in regards to the, uh, the health care yeah. of the vets. Yeah. But sometimes we hear these horror stories regarding uh, negligence of health care because to me, mental health is a part of health care. Yes. And you have a lot of veterans on the street in need of mental health care um, who are not getting it. But then there are those veterans who are exceptionally and getting great health care. But, you know, it's it's not, to me, it wasn't, it's not balanced, the, the stories that we hear. But I, uh, well, let's just say, let's just say with a, we can listen to some things with a jaundice ear. A couple, a couple things to note. One of the problems, and it's something in my opinion that they should correct and fix, is that veterans right now who are, are under veteran care, okay, that uh, have a disability and they've been approved, which is a long process, by the way, if that wasn't diagnosed and part of their, their exit package, and it was diagnosed five years later, to get back into the system is extremely difficult. Yes, it it takes years. And appeals. Okay? I, I know I've done it for a friend. Okay? It, it's awful. Um, the, the problem is the VA thinks in a monolithic fashion. A veteran should be able to go to any hospital and get the care at any hospital. But if they're going to an overburdened place, whether it's Walter Reed or Balboa, Reed being probably the two primary, um, there's a queue. There's a line. And they're waiting. And they can only handle so many at a time. When there's other facilities that should be able to handle veterans, they, but they don't allow it. And it has to do with insurance and all that other nutty stuff, all right, which should be irrelevant, especially for those people. I think the press does, they're trying to do a service by showing homeless veterans. But the reason I gave a statistic for one in 10 adults are veterans, I, I don't think you're going to find that one in 10 of homeless people are veterans. I don't think it's the case. I think it's an even mix and it's, it's different. Um, some people, uh, and I heard a homeless veteran told me, he goes, well, I, I'd rather not be homeless, but I'm tough enough, I could be homeless forever. You know, that's, there's a certain mental toughness that comes with that too. Right, and my comment wasn't really for the, even though it included the homeless, but it was more so the veterans with, that may be with a family member but has a mental health diagnosis, if you will. Yeah, I, you know, and, and I don't know. I, I still think that if the veteran can go to any hospital, 
and it be paid for by the government as right. you know, that's Absolutely. part of the bargain. Absolutely. Okay? Then they'd be better served instead of just having to get pigeonholed to be a facility. Now a child of this generation, and I don't go to libraries anymore, if it isn't online, it doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned. I, I, didn't, I did not find anything specific to the Confederacy with uh, uh, having to do with uh, VRC type units. Didn't find anything to that. The, the Civil War is so heavily documented, okay, it is so heavily written about, it is such a, it's such a pivotal point in our nation's history, uh, that the fact that it's first, no one knows about anything about the Veterans Reserve Corps. I'm, I'm sure all of us had no idea there were 30,000 uh, seriously injured veterans serving. Uh, that the fact that there is very little information regarding uh, the South respected to this subject tells me that they didn't want to record it for whatever reason. For whatever reason. Remember, a lot of the, the, the history of the Civil War is written through letters, through correspondence. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's actually 150 years removed. It, it's, uh, it, I know it's horrific. It is, wonder, it is a wonderment to read these things. It's really amazing. It could have been written by uh, one of our children. The language in those letters is yeah, it's, beautiful. Yeah, it, it's it's almost poetic. Yeah, it's almost poetic. So, well, thank you very much for your time and attention. I really appreciate it.